what we see is what I feel is a manufactured character for the media who is framed as some sort of Tony Stark Marvel character and then try and frame them as some kind of hero of free speech to disguise these organisations are being run by the establishment. Using a mascot such as Musk makes people not to be so alarmed. Plus, they can always blame things on this individual if things go wrong and move on with their plan to use somebody or something else. So, when I say Elon in this video, think the establishment when I say his name, because that's what it is in my opinion. As if, I mean, as if someone would be allowed to become this rich and powerful and be independent of the authorities. Musk was even one of those world economic young global leaders. Amongst many other things, just check out my old videos about him. Go to hugohoops.com and type in Elon Musk in the search bar at the top of the site to find all of the videos I've done on him. One recent one was about why he and the establishment are acquiring Twitter because they want to change it into the X app, which is a version of the Chinese WeChat social credit score all-in-one monitoring spy app that they use in China. Whether they change it into that or destroy Twitter and then herd people into a new one, I don't know. One or the other. I mean, he even admits to it in this clip. I mean, we have uh, a, 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 an app that's as good as WeChat in China. Uh, and like in China, you can like, live on WeChat, basically. Uh, yeah. It's like, yeah, everyone, everyone's like that. It's like, you live on WeChat. You do payments, you do everything. It's like, well, no, it's great. It's WeChat's big ass. Um, and we don't have any WeChat outside of China. So, I like, my dear would be like, how about if we just copy WeChat? Hey. Copy them. The fire director copies WeChat? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so there you go. Buy a company and then create a counterfeit copy of someone else's idea. This is the Elon Musk strategy. All of the companies he has been involved with existed or were, were already created and were successful in their own right before he came along to invest and buy them. The establishment doesn't like independent businesses and they like to take them over when they get too big. Anyway, this video is about this headline here from yesterday. One of the beast systems plans for the future. Elon Musk confident Neuralink brain chips will cure blindness and restore mobility as he aims for human tribes in six months. He says it's like replacing a piece of skull with a smartwatch. Now you notice in this how we see yet another piece of invasive technology. I mean, you can't get any more invasive than taking over your brain. This invasive technology being sold to the public as being beneficial to your health. How it could help you. Just like the jib jabs were sold to you. Just like the Vax passports were sold to you. Like, like the digital IDs are sold to you. You know, oh, oh look, illegal immigrants everywhere. It's all about, oh, we need everyone now to have digital IDs. We don't know who is who anymore. It's dangerous. We need digital IDs. It's for your safety. And now we've got Elon here saying he wants to cure the blind and heal the sick. Sounding a bit like Jesus there, copying that idea as well. Elon, for some reason, is very, very popular though. People are blinded to what this establishment puppet is. And there are tons, tons of influencers who support him as well. Talk him up all of the time and attempt to keep this fantasy in continuance. It's sad. So many continue to look for a full side of the follow. You know, they will always, they will always provide a full side of for you to follow. This is why the gate is wide destruction and is narrow to the truth. This is the this is the guy who shows off in a Baphomet costume with upside down crosses, a costume called Devil's Champion, whose ex-girlfriend also dons upside down crosses, who likes to set up photo shoots of her reading the Communist Manifesto. I mean they are telling the public what side they are on. I mean, he who has eyes, let them see, yeah? So anyway, they are talking about how they're going to start doing human trials here, about with these uh, brain microchips. It says here, it was stated at a convention 
even if someone has never had vision ever, like they were born blind, we believe we can still restore their vision, Elon Musk said. Neuralink's last public presentation more than a year ago involved a monkey with a brain chip that played a computer game by thinking alone. It turned out loads of these monkeys died and experienced extreme suffering after being experimented on. Who in their right minds would sign up to uh, test this microchip? They must be out of their minds. Uh, Musk went on to say, as miraculous, as miraculous as that may sound, we are confident that it is possible to restore full body functionality to someone who has a set of spinal cord, Musk said at the event. So now he is talking miraculous, miracles, heal the sick, make the blind see again. And it sounds miraculous, he said. So look, here we see Thessalonians, yeah? And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall continue with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So promising miracles, lying signs and wonders. Now, not that I think Elon is the man of lawlessness, no, but he is of the Antichrist spirit. How could the supposed richest man on earth not be? I mean, the richest man on earth must be the greediest man on earth. I mean, personally, I think he's a puppet and he's not actually the richest man. But if you believe what they say, then you believe he is, then how greedy can someone be? Apparently, it says here, he has only donated 0.001 donating some billions recently to a charity, but that has apparently not been confirmed, so it says here. So anyway, emulating the healing of the sick, making the blind see again. A deception, I believe, because what this chip I feel is all about is not for therapeutic needs, it's for linking people's minds, networking them up to the cloud. The concept is for widespread use, hooking people up to the cloud, where you're in a most thought could be sold to the highest bidders. It's the ultimate control over people. And the primary driver for all of this is clear. It's not about health. As you can see here, their first product will link your brain box up with your black mirror device, Satan's devices, yeah? Elon Musk says Neuralink's first product will control smartphones with brain implants. Who needs a touch screen when you've got your mind? This is where I believe it's all gone. And this seems very much like the end of days, to me anyway. And yet with all this obviousness, Elon Musk is still popular, lauded as a hero by many online, a hero of free speech, a champion wearing a, a devil's champion costume. This is, I believe, all part of the strong delusion that so many people fall in love with the lie because they have no foundation. They are easily persuaded. They follow trends at the drop of a hat. They follow the materialistic. They follow the money. They have no connection to the spiritual, no connection to their gut instinct. They lack discernment because of this. What did Lenin say? The best way to control the opposition is to lead it ourselves. What does communism do? It always seeks to purge the faith of its people, of the society it wants to take over. Note my last video on all the reports of Christianity declining and how they want to remove it from all public policies and law. Remove it because without faith, people have no foundation and are more easily manipulated and moved. Discernment is lacking in the majority because over time, they have bred the desire for the spiritual out of the majority of the population by giving them a long line of false idols and vacuous movie stars and celebrities to worship, spreading circuses, all promoted through the mainstream media and now directly accessible through their now portable black mirror devices that the majority carry around with them everywhere. So we find ourselves in a world where now everything seems back to front, upside down, inverted, 
spread through his eye, where that is good. And many people feel alienated from this world, and why wouldn't you? They feel like they don't fit in anymore. And this fits in with Bible prophecy as well. Wars, rumors of wars, one world religion, one world government, which is the beast that rises out of the sea in Revelation, which is what people uh, refer to as the beast system. And this system having authority over, as it says, over every tribe, people, language, and nation. And for those that don't submit, persecution will increase, which goes in line with what I've been talking about recently. That's why we're seeing the anti-Christian agenda starting to ramp up. The system will uh, turn against those who stand for this. But if we look at the Bible, John 15, 19, which is Jesus saying that those who follow him will also be persecuted, it says, If the world hates you, ye know that it hates me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. What is popular now of the world? Elon Musk is popular. He is of the world. Media personalities are popular. They are of the world. Black mirror devices are popular. They are of the world. But that is now an upside down world. A world where a guy buys Twitter, apparently, his profile has an avatar of him wearing a satanic upside down cross Baphomet outfit. He declares he wants to put microchips into everyone's head. He's supposedly richest man in the world, but has donated less than 0.001% of his money. And this person is popular because he is of the world. You reap what you sow. I don't expect to become popular with these videos in the future. I will only become more unpopular as things continue, the more I talk about this type of thing. If you are feeling like a fish out of water, as you don't understand what is going on, Take that as a good sign that you are on the right side of the fence. Take it as a warning to not allow yourself to be persuaded or coerced into the forthcoming system. Like I said before, Revelation 18, 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. This is about mystery Babylon. The corrupt system that makes war against the saints at the end of time because everything goes picked up basically because all of these control freaks are going to lose they are on the losing side but they want to engage people to be on that losing side with them just don't let yourself get caught up with it come out of my people it's a warning to come out of the system before it is destroyed and i'll leave you with this one here romans 12 2 and do not be conformed to this world, okay? Conformed meaning behave according to social norms or following the crowd of trends. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. As always, thanks for listening. Come and sub to the HugoTools.com website. If you want to be notified, when I upload videos so that you don't have to rely on notifications from third parties. See you later. You know what I mean? Control our population. The whole purpose throughout history has been to teach a small number of people how to become a deaf that controlling everyone else. The goal is to destroy all existing religions, save theirs, all existing governments, save theirs. Shackle the mob in a system of eternal oppressive death chain to a computer for the rest of their life in a propagandized world to make them believe that they are happy in this system. Now, do you think they're succeeding? Haven't I described to you just now exactly what is going on in the world today?
Hey, are you coming? Yeah, just gotta find something to wear. child in a cartoon world with going to meetings with bubbly dinosaurs and people who are flying around the room. I just don't. All right. First of all, let me let me just give you a taste here. See World Economic Forum. They are tweeting about it right away. Facebook is now meta. What is the metaverse and why should we care? Look, little tiny children surrounded by cold blue light with the virtual reality headsets tethered to something and living their lives in a fake world. The metaverse is not yet a reality, but it could be the next evolution of the internet. The idea is that extended reality, the combination of augmented virtual and mixed reality, will become a key medium for social and business engagement. They say the metaverse doesn't exist, at least not yet. As of today, there isn't anything that could be legitimately identified as a metaverse just as you can't invest in the internet, so too can you not identify the metaverse as a unique product, technology, or service. A better question might be, what could become the metaverse? And I've made a note here. I guess it's a place with bad grammar. That's a terrible sentence. What, what could become the metaverse? Well, you see, we're all going to have to get used to hacked up language because in the far-off dreams of the architects of the metaverse and virtual reality, the matrix world, we will all be able to communicate with each other, almost, in fact, non-verbally is what they say, in almost a telepathy, and there will be just one language. What does this remind you of? Anybody? Any Bible scholars out there? Any, any Christians out there? Anybody who just basically knows the stories of the Bible? Does not remind you of the Tower of Babel, man trying to become as gods, everybody speaking with one language, and God came along and he punished us by making us all speak different languages so we couldn't get along, so we couldn't centralize. Aren't these maniacs always talking about decentralization? Well, let me tell you, the metaverse is massive, massive centralization. And of course, the ingredients of this include the ability to buy and sell and conduct business in the virtual reality space. Why do you think they stopped innovating in the real world with 3D things? Why do you think everything's going to junk furniture and crappy products? It's because soon we won't need real products very much at all anymore. We're going to buy and sell and do all our business in this virtual reality world. A lot of people think they can just stay out of it. And you can, you can stay out of it. But I argue you can't dabble in it and stay out of it. It's one or the other. If you dabble in it and you get hooked, you take the apple, you give it a bite, you're done. You're out of this Garden of Eden, this paradise, the real world, forever. That's what I argue. And uh, in case you think this isn't bad enough already, look at the next iteration. The future of church. Christians will no longer need to long for divine encounters. Saintly holograms and smart robots can appear in Christian gatherings anywhere, anytime. Look at this creepy stuff. If you can't tell already, this is demonic. We are in a battle of good versus evil. And what has Satan always wanted? He has wanted to usurp the, the world. He has wanted to be God. Well, I, I, I mean... I don't know a better explanation for what is happening than this is the final countdown to when Satan rules the globe. Because if you look into these virtual reality worlds, these alternate reality worlds, Mark Zuckerberg is very wholesome, actually, from what he's presenting. But most of them, if not all of the ones that are out there right now, are absolutely debauched, dark violent, overly sexual. There's all kinds of hidden rooms in them where pedophiles gather. Even on Microsoft's Roblox, 
there's a place for pedophiles. So yeah, I, I would say, it, like in my estimation, the virtual reality world is going to be Satan's dominion. He will he will trap you basically between your body and con and your consciousness. Like not that's not what I mean. It's like limbo. You you could live forever in the virtual reality world because another thing they're working on, of course, is uploading your whole mind and all of your experiences and memories and personality into the cloud so that you can live forever as an avatar. So what does that what does that do to your soul? I wonder. I really believe this is a soul trap. An interesting point about Meta. Mark Zuckerberg's new company, Meta, where he's building the Metaverse, is that apparently in Hebrew, Meta means dead. Someone pointed this out to me, and um, apparently it's true. Hebrew users of Twitter were saying that dead is pronounced Meta in Hebrew. And I also want to show you the word for Meta in Hebrew. It's this. It looks a lot like the symbol for Meta to me. Does it to you? This user posted something on 4chan talking about how they're creating a second layer of reality and shunting as many souls as possible into it. Right now, it's just a shitty VR chat clone, but the end goal is beyond what most people can imagine. And then he talks about what's in the nano gel in the vaccines and basically goes into what I talked about in my last video, how there's this patent where we, we, they're going to be able to sense our organ movement, our nerve impulses, our heart rate, our blood flow, the microbes in our stomach, everything, everything can be sensed by these tiny nanobots, nanoparticles, and in various things, it's not just in the vaccine. People suspect they're in food, but that they're being put into the air, and therefore they go into the soil, and they're in everything. And this connects us to the Internet of Things, which then makes it possible for them to make this matrix reality over top of the real world. At this point, yes, you still have to voluntarily um, put on the goggles or whatever to participate in it, but actually you are possibly already participating in it. Your avatar is, so to speak. Your, the, the, the situational environment is already participating in it. Right, so it's not, this is creepy enough right here. But I want to introduce you to something else. This book called Dead Souls by a man named Nikolai Gogol. Now, okay, Facebook is in Google, or so we think. So I'm taking a bit of a turn here, left turn. But just get this. Nikolai Gogol wrote this book called Dead Souls way back in Russia's serfdom days. And listen to the description of it. It was the day of serfdom in Russia, and a man's standing was often judged by the number of souls he possessed. There was a periodical census of serfs, say once every 10 or 10, 20 years. This being the case, an owner had to pay a tax on every soul registered at the last census, even though some of the serfs might have died in the meantime. Nevertheless, the system had its material advantages, inasmuch as an owner might borrow money from a bank of the dead souls, just the same as he could on the living ones. So the hero of this story, called Chichikov, goes around making a deal with the, uh, the lords who owned these dead souls. And he said, well, you don't want to pay the tax, I'll buy them off you. So he was intending to get himself a whole cadre of serfs assigned to his name, thereby making him wealthy. He would be an owner of many, many serfs, even though they were dead. Is this creepy or what? I mean, that really happened in Russia. I don't know if a guy went around trying to buy the dead ones, but that's how they ran uh, the, their economic system in Russia when they had lords and serfs. And the guy who wrote the book about this name is Gogol. When, when they started the company Google, people asked them what it was all about, and the story was, they named it Google because there's a mathematical term called Google, 
which means infinite or something. I don't know what it means. But what if the name actually is a play on Nikolai Gogol's name because of this book called Dead Souls? And what if Google's whole game from the beginning was to catalog every soul on the planet? And then, even if they died, they could still get value out of all the information, the essence of the person that they had cataloged. Sergey Brin, CEO of Google, it happens to be of Russian descent, and Nikolai Gogol was Russian. His wife, Susan Wojcicki, what brand YouTube and Susan's sister Anne is CEO of 23andMe which of course you know is a collection that you're supposed to send in your DNA to 23andMe and they will tell you all about your heritage that's what they say I say it's just a big info gathering operation I mean come on people figure it out and these two Susan and Anne their heritage is, is, is Jewish in some places it actually says Russian Jewish but now, most commonly, it says Polish. I have to say, this name seems more Polish than Russian, but I don't know. So is this group, the power team, kind of along the same lines as Chichikov in Nikolai Gogol's book, Dead Souls, where they're going around and they're collecting up avatar characteristics, complete people with as much possible information on them as they can get, to, in a sense, keep them alive forever for their own profit. What could they use them for? Well, I, my imagination goes crazy, but, for example, can dead souls inhabit avatars online? And could these manufacture society, manufacture consensus, consent, manufacture mobs, manufacture the idea that we're all going together in this one direction, a hive mind, but they're not even real. They're not even living. They're just dead souls. All right, so that, that, that seems separate from the Facebook venture at this point, but who's to say Mark Zuckerberg wasn't running the same sort of thing? After all, he's got the, the catalog of people's lives from Facebook. They're, they're practically their every move for Time they signed, from the time they signed up until today. I don't know, it's just an interesting thought. And obviously Google is going to have its own version of this someday through its partner organizations. And many other companies will get into the game too. There, there already are many companies in this game. Epic Games is one of them. Epic Games talks about how it trained AI through online gaming like Fortnite, and different games like that. People, and this is what I'm talking about when I say you, can, you can't you can dabble. People think, oh, I can just play Fortnite, it's fine. You can't, because they are using you to build this matrix and to create the data bank of dead souls that will forever, theoretically, if you look at it biblically, be trapped, be prevented from getting to heaven. Essentially sort of reducing the... Uh, quantity of people, quantity of energy that's being used for good. I don't know, okay? I really don't. One final thing about meta and its symbol. This symbol actually moves it's when it spins, and so from certain angles it looks like those two ends I showed you earlier. Then when it's stable from this view, it looks like the Ouroboros, the snake eating its own tail, the infinity symbol. Ouroboros. Emblem, emblematic serpent of ancient Egypt and Greece, represented with its tail in its mouth, continually devouring itself and being reborn from itself. A Gnostic and alchemical symbol, symbol Ouroboros expresses the unity of all things, material and spiritual, which never disappear, but perpetually change in an eternal cycle of destruction and recreation. In the 19th century, a vision of Ouroboros gave the German chemist August Kekulé von Stradenitz the idea of linked carbon atoms forming the benzene ring. Well, the first part, where nothing ever disappears, just perpetually changes form in an eternal cycle of destruction and recreation, totally it reminds me of this. 
and it also reminds me of all the transhumanist visions that there are out there. But secondly, isn't it interesting that it is linked carbon atoms in chemistry? Because right now, with the graphene, we're talking about that all over again. All right. Uh, this one, I guess, this is more poly, so I get to be a little more clumsy. I just want you to um, think very carefully about meta because it is the entry, I believe, into if there was a sort of a prison for souls to trap them, a soul trap, that's what meta looks like to me. Okay? Thanks for listening, everybody. I'm going to stop talking now. Please support my work. Please support my work if you like it. Go over to my website, amazingpolly.net, and you can make an online contribution there, or you can send me something through the mail. I still occasionally get cash in uh, in um, tinfoil. Pleases me no end. It's just a funny little thing that I enjoy. Um, you can write me a check. You get to Polly Media. You do that. But what I want to say, though, is, is I want to say thanks to those that have been on the channel, man. Some of you guys, I can say it's out the comments of your part. You consider me just like I consider, you know, doing this. And some of you guys know who be doing this stuff to it. You have an audience, or you have the time, or you have the resources, you know, information, uh, or knowledge of uh, some of the stuff that I've been privy to. I know some of you do more and have a bigger part, man. I mean, you need to think about this, man. Some of you need to think about this more. Okay? And I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not telling anybody what they need to work on. But think about it. If, if, if everything I say has been right, okay, it's been accurate, which it has been up to this point, right? Uh, the only thing we don't know, and I'm not on the fifth, like I said, I don't know for certain, but I, I'm almost, I'm leaning forward. But we don't know the whole Trump effect. Okay, I told y'all that there's there's two Trumps for one thing, and uh, we know that there's two evil in this world. We know the evil has infiltrated the political party, the political system. Now, what that means is that that's where the fight is going to be. Okay, in order to control it and help people to some degree, like people expect somebody to just pop out the sky and start killing bad guys. That's not how this thing's gonna go. That's what you're looking for, that's not how it's gonna go. Now either you can uh, fight, or you can concede defeat. And that's what I see a lot of saints have done. They have conceded defeat by accepting the fact that the Bible is the, is, is the law of the land and everything that's in there is how it's gonna be and there's no fighting against Turn the other cheek, lay down, take take the mark of die. That's your only option. And lay in your bed, wait for Jesus to return. I'm sorry, guys. I don't believe that. Okay, I don't believe that's how we're supposed to go out. On top of that, what you have to understand is also through the trial before Christ, before Jesus, or Yahshua is to return, there will be a, a, a period of trial and tribulation. So you still got to go through every part of which. Okay, if you want to go off the biblical aspect of it, you still got to survive the trial of tribulation, which will come in, in many different forms. Okay, now we all know that Obama was ordering the guillotine to stuff to chop the head off. Who about the mark, the mark of the beast, the six, 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 the folks are on the forehead, but come on, we in a new age, guys. Innovation. Okay, now they put it under the skin. Still they, if they reach your forehead, boy, they got the mark that they looking for, right? Under the skin. Okay, boom, where they put the loop, the race in, uh, the skin, what they try to turn everybody into, uh, uh, service of the devil, okay, so I'm trying to combine you to hell, by putting this, this thing in your, your system, this, uh, this alien parasite, okay, I keep telling y'all, I'm not gonna go over this all over again, I'm not gonna do it, so I'm gonna tell y'all once again, okay, things are not as they seem. Okay, you guys that have been working on cutting people off from their spirituality, which will cut you off from the most high, keep you from being able to ascend, okay, to 
to the upper dimension, which is what most people believe and, and, and have uh, learned or come to believe that that is heaven. Okay, which that's another story. But you know, for all intents and purposes, what I'm trying to describe to you guys is that these things are just they're putting people are attacking their spiritual, their spiritual essence, their spiritual self. They won't have any spiritual powers. Okay, that's why you see these people sitting around and looking at everything. They don't see it with a physical, but it's not there in a physical. These things are designed to go in and attack the spirit. Okay, but what I'm trying to tell you is that they are, they are they're going to be implementing things that are basically from the Bible. So it will come off like, oh, this is a, um, this is a physical and everything else, which it is to some degree. But like I told you, the Bible is contemporary. It helps people to control the world, to fight back, keep us from believing how we can do certain things. It's not giving you your full spiritual power, and I'm watching. that's I'm what they aim to keep you grounded. You know, they want you to be able to be as powerful as God is. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, Andy was a child participant in Project Pegasus, which was the US time space exploration program at the time of the emergence of time travel in the US defense technical community. Andrew was on a crusade as a lawyer and statesman to have the US government disclose its time travel secrets. He believes that lobbying the US government to declassify its secret teleportation capability so that teleportation can be adopted globally as the leading form of civilian transport is the most important environmental cause of our time. In 2016, Andrew D. Bashava will be a candidate for President of the United States under the banner Andy 2016, A Time for Truth. Welcome Andy. Thank you for coming uh, on to the Skype interview for us today. Thank you, Christian. Um, I've been watching quite a lot of your work recently and I've gotten beyond intrigued, I can say. And one of the questions I was thinking about is why were you children? I mean, there's so many children. What, what made you extra special? Well, I have some special abilities. Let me go back to the, the, the initial factor. My late father, Raymond, uh, shortly after graduating with BS in electrical engineering from Lehigh University in 1951, uh, after the famous July 1952 overflight of Washington, D.C., by nine extraterrestrial craft that fought on radar at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia as traveling at 7,000 miles per hour and also exhibiting such properties as disappearing at one location in the sky and then reappearing elsewhere in the sky, had the unusual experience of having a U.S. military officer appear the side of his desk at overnight company in Gramercy, New Jersey. He was working in a non-defense technical capacity. But my father was brilliant, not just in engineering, but in, in mathematics and physics, which made up part of his course of study at the uh, So this officer instructed him that the next Monday morning, he should report not to overnight, but to Curtis Wright in Wood Ridge, New Jersey, where he was assigned to the Ramjet engine project. The Ramjet was a supersonic craft that was hoped to be able to chase the extraterrestrial craft out of the Earth's atmosphere and even operate in the near Earth environment. And my dad was tasked with the responsibility of designing a metal alloy that would enable the craft to operate at those speeds, both in the atmosphere and in space, without melting from friction from all air and the atmosphere and molecules of space dust in space. So literally sort of scoop these flying saucers away from our planet. The lives of US airmen were sometimes lost in those activities in the early saucer flight of the 1960s. And so he continued to work in classified defense related engineering capacities so that the flight of my birth in September of nineteen sixty one, my father had already worked on several very sensitive aerospace projects. 
with reporting requirements from the CIA, the Air Force, the Navy, and so forth. Now, in early childhood, I entered kindergarten at age four, and the, in September 1966, and of course, returned age five, I was born in September 61. So, prior to my entry into kindergarten, I had been exhibiting non ordinary abilities, but a special ability at our home in Mars Plains, New Jersey, the USA. And my father had witnessed one of the things I was doing. I was going down into a carpentry shop in our cellar, and I was listening to him thinking to himself, and then, and then talking to him with knowledge of what he was thinking about. In other words, he became aware that I was telepathic and I was picking up his thoughts and then saying things relative to what he was thinking. He also came out of the cell at one time and threw our breakfast he was on the ground floor of the house. And he saw me, it's not levitating, but just causing several of my small toys, my, my alphabet blocks and some paper toys, to hover three feet off the ground. What I had done is pick them up and place them about three feet off the ground. And that was not only causing them to hover, but some of the toys were actually orbiting around each other in the way that our Earth orbit orbits the sun. So I had either the latent abilities of things human beings used to do, or the incipient abilities of the so-called indigo children. I like to say that I wasn't uh, a trailing edge baby boomer, I was a leading edge indigo. And my father was totally an expert in physics. He had studied it at one of the world's leading engineering uh, universities, and he was working in it. For quite then, around 1964, he had moved on to the Thomas A. Edison Research Lab in West Orange, New Jersey, where he repeated many of Nikola Tesla's teleportation experiments, uh, his, his mortal teleportation experiments that Tesla had been working on going back to 1899 during his famous day in Colorado, Prince Colorado. So my father was not just a defense technical engineer, he was an expert on some of the new applications in quantum physics that were coming along. So I think that what must have happened is must have informed the classified defense technical community. This would be the group of physicists, engineers, and, and, and engineers who were working on, 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 on new weaponry and new ways of gathering in intelligence uh, in an EM spectrum in which we would be what we think of about 1% of what's visible in the EM spectrum. So they were working on espionage devices where they could see things that were in the visible range of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. And they began to work on on devices that would enable us to have a counterforce ability vis-a-vis the extraterrestrials, who, for example, were, were going one place in the sky and then they, they would blink out and immediately show up somewhere else in the sky. So they began working on essentially what we might broadly caption as time travel devices. So I know that my father had passed along my special ability to the United States Defense Department because he began taking me to some of these classified uh, engineering locations in New Jersey in the summer after my kindergarten year, which was the summer of 1967. Uh, so I had clearly a file that had made of me because, you know, Project Talent was searching for young Americans of, of high intelligence, high psychic ability, and evidence of, of, of native political ability, basically those would be the leaders of our generation. And uh, so I know that my name must have ended up in some file involving the Indigo children that were emerging at that time, events and these special abilities. But I never really talked to my father about why I was selected for the program. The bottom line was that I was, and I did so as the son of a U.S. aerospace engineer with reporting requirements to the CIA and other intelligence agencies. And that was in the nature of what government officials, intelligence community members, and military officers were doing during the net Cold War context. They were basically volunteering uh, some of their most intelligent progeny into these government projects because the U.S. government was very concerned about two perceived threats. They knew we were being visited by extraterrestrials and they didn't know what the agenda of these different extraterrestrial races were. And they were also very concerned about World War III uh, between the United States and the former Soviet Union. 
they actually believe that the number one military threat to the continent of the United States was probably not uh, either a limited or all out nuclear war with the USSR because that would lead to the destruction of the former Soviet Union as well. So they believed that we were in a stalemate. But they were concerned about a land invasion of the continent of the United States by the Soviet army uh, aboard the Soviet Navy, which was as large as the United States was a capable Navy. And so they wanted to develop devices that would enable us to gather intelligence about what the extraterrestrial and the former Soviet Union were doing, and also be able to operate in a military theater in which some of the technology that we would have to possess counterforce were operating uh, essentially in the invisible range of the electromagnetic spectrum, essentially to cope with potential adversaries who were in possession of the time travel. So Andrew, as I understand it, you were only six years old then. Um, how, how did it feel for you to be taken into a very out of the ordinary situation? Well, it was very um, astonishing. I would say even shocking. What happened was, we know I was age six, and I can explain that. But, uh, essentially, my father drove us from our home in Mars Plains, New Jersey, to the old Curtis Wright Aeronautical Company facility in Woods Bridge, New Jersey, that he had originally been assigned to between 1952 and 55 to work on the ramp. In fact, my dad first traveled to New Mexico conventionally to flight test the ramjet engine at, at White Sands uh, Proving Grounds in New Mexico. So there were many, many different buildings, but that's the principal location uh, in the United States where Allied aircraft were designed and manufactured during World War II. And so I remember him taking up to Curtis Wright. I remember going through a small air museum with about eight to ten absolutely beautiful reconditioned uh, aircraft that had been designed by Glenn Curtis, who was as as my dad and I know, an associate uh, aer aerospace designer, air, air designer, along with uh, the Wright brother, hence the name Curtis Wright. So we would go through that air museum uh, and shoot what kind of security folks, and we were given access then to the engineering building and Building 68, which was one of the, the many numbered buildings there. And in a room in Building 68, there at Curtis Wright, about the size of, let's say, a high school classroom was an object that consisted of two gray-colored armatures. They were elliptical boons that were standing on their bases that had been designed into the ellipses. So they were standing there, they were about eight feet tall, about 10 feet apart on the ground. And my dad, the, the left boon was, was connected to a rudimentary computer console that a technician was sitting behind, was sitting behind a keyboard and a, a rudimentary screen. The right boom was attached to an industrial strength power cord and plugged into the, the uh, power uh, outlet in the wall. And my dad instructed the technician to turn the device on, and we stood about 10 feet away from the radiant energy that began to be broadcast between the two booms. This device had been one of the devices that had been found schematic form in the papers of Nikola Tesla that were seized by the War Department upon Nikola Tesla's death in New York City on January 7, 1943, and the War Department forwarded Tesla's papers to the world's leading physicists that were then gathered in Los Alamos, New Mexico, the building atomic bomb. And what we didn't know is that Tesla's papers were never lost. They were forwarded to the Project Manhattan physicists. Individuals like Enrico Fermi, for example, one of the hidden uh, progenitors of the U.S. time uh, travel capability. So my dad had the technician turn the device on, and the radiant energy that Tesla had discovered as a form of energy that was latent and pervasive in the physical universe suddenly was illuminated between the two buildings. And it looked, it was very beautiful. It looked like water falling in a public sculpture, such as you'll find in a park where the, the sculpture has used falling water as, as a design element. But then my dad had us go up a foot from the energy field, and it looked like black and white raster on a television set, a snow pattern that gets in the old black and white TV sets. And I could see that emanating from portals that were about three inches apart on both on the interior of uh, 
concave side of both of these elliptical shaped moons. There were small, small ports that were emitting a bluish green light path that was moving across the radiant energy, sort of squiggling like a catapult going along in the water. And my dad explained that on the count of three, he would hold hands and jump through the energy pattern, the, this field of radiant energy. And we would find ourselves in a, an illuminated tunnel for several seconds. And then the tunnel would close and we would find ourselves, as he put it, on a hillside elsewhere in the United States. But in fact, the hillside was the state capital grounds in Santa Fe, New Mexico, a distance of some 2,005 miles from Woodbridge, New Jersey. So we did a couple of dry runs where we held my hand and we practiced leaping forward on the count of three. How did you feel? I, I, was, I was astonished. For one thing, I looked over at my father when we were in the tunnel, and his hair was moving all over the place because of the electrostatic energy. He later said that I looked absolutely terrified. <laughs> oh my Eventually overwhelmed because we were moving through a portal tunnel in time space that was illuminated in a bluish white glow. When I looked to the left and the right, I could see adjacent timelines. I could see events in holographic form that were visible in the walls uh, of the of the portal tunnel, almost like a almost like a television image. But there was a, basically a, a, a a rapid series of these holographic images because we were cutting through other timelines between Woodridge in real time and Santa Fe in real time. And I was just astonished as to the environment that I found myself in. And essentially, that was the incident in which I leaped into the U.S. Time Space Program because at the end of that journey, we drove from Santa Fe uh, up to the Los Alamos National Labs and met with Dr. Ag and he asked my father my age and he said, sit. So I think that's an important event, both leaping through the device at that time and meeting with Dr. Agnew at the time that I was age six, because that means that the U.S. Defense Technical Group was secretly in possession of a physical teleportation technology by 1967-68, which means they spent, what, 25 years tinkering with different schematics that Tesla had left in his lab manual, and they discovered that that one was a teleporter, and they were using technology. Now, when you're when you're telling me about this tunnel, I then uh, think of the, the stories you hear of near-death experiences of people mentioning this travel through a portal tunnel. Could it be that it's a similar type of experience? Yes, I think there are direct comparisons between the kind of physical teleportation of the Tesla or portal teleporter allowed and so-called instances of spiritual teleportation because in certain energetic states when you have, for example, human beings with an avatar and is in possession of more potential use of their brain or perhaps even of the soul than the average human being or when you're talking about the dense energy field that radiant energy is clearly the same process ultimately is, is working because whether it's the brain or mind of human beings spiritually teleporting or it's a device that opens up that portal panel. People do report spontaneous events where under some condition of great stress, for example, a survival crisis, they suddenly move through the physical universe in a non-ordinary way involving a tunnel. In fact, I, when I was fact-finding in New Mexico, I took great make the lengthy fact-finding trip to New Mexico in 2003, 4, and 8 to go back and find the locations that my father and I had visited in Project Pegasus and try to find some of the surviving family members and friends from that time and so forth. And those ended up being three very successful trips. I basically proved my involvement in Project Pegasus by taking those trips to investigation. But uh, just serendipitously during the 2004 trip, I met a woman named Kathleen at the State Capitol Complex uh, in San Fernando, Mexico who sadly had been struck by a car in the middle of the street and had her small fraction of the range. And she described how a man had come out of the house and helped her. And she had asked for an ambulance. And he didn't come out of the house. Either he was taking too much time calling, calling 911 or he had just decided to not help her. And she describes getting up with a fractured skull and having a flash of, of images where she went to one location 
and then with a flash of another set of images, and she reached her mother's house in a time in which when she recovered fully, thank God from her injury, she became a marathon runner, and she could not run between the accident site and the mile or two from her mother's house at the speed that she did in the time of the accident, and her mother's intervention had her mother out. So we know that under life threatening crises, people can literally overcome the ordinary balance of time space and change and essentially spiritually teleport. And we of, of course have examples of great religious and philosophical avatars in human history doing something similar. So we know that the human spirit is capable of overcoming the bounds of the physical universe. The benefit of the physical teleporter that we're referencing is going to really important in the festival is that a technology can be turned on a device and enable anybody to teleport at any time, not just because they're a Mahatma and a great soul, but or, or an ordinary human being in an extraordinary life threatening crisis, but simply as a result of going to a public teleport. So why are we not using this today, Andrew? What happened, in fact, the reason I'm speaking out, and what is in fact the hidden mystery of the US time travel capability, is that the different devices were weaponized during the Cold War. The Tesla teleporter was hoped would allow US troops to be placed precisely where they were needed on the battlefield. The electro-optical device called Pranava, which propagates moving holographic images of past and future events, were clearly an advanced intelligence gathering uh, technology. So as these different forms of what I call quantum access, the ability to use this technology to send somebody to a distant location in the time space continuum, or to gather remote images of a non-local event, an event scenario they all were weaponized as classified defense technology during the Cold War and stepped back from the public. And I believe that has been a disaster. I mean, imagine that you're in London and you want to get home to New Zealand, to back to all. Instead of taking 24 hours sitting aboard a commercial uh, airplane, having a higher risk of blood clots and, and, and other medical events sitting on a cramped and curling. Through a portal tunnel in time space and reach awkward in several seconds. In the case of the uh, coronavirus, imagine the renaissance in education and science and interest of young people in applied science, which we need more of. If they could go to a museum, let's say the National Museum in their country, and view moving holographic images of the auspicious events, not just in the life of their countrymen and women, but in the life of any great ones to come. This technology has also been available, not just theoretically, but more practically available. Humanity, since around 1970, we were small children. And from 1970, there was the time that Al Gore was sitting in his college class in Harvard, in Dr. Roger Rebell's uh, greenhouse effect, the summit of climate change or global warming, and studying the effects of, of carbon dioxide on traditional forms of transportation, conventional things like aircraft. We could have been moving around the world in seconds with no input or output that is of carbon dioxide. Transportation just contributed 60% of the greenhouse gases that are affecting climate change. So we really are stuck in the 1970s. I think it's an emergency. And I to the extent that global population is going to go from 7 billion to 9 billion by 2045. I'm making it my life's work to achieve the declassification deployment of Tesla teleportation for transport in real time, not for time travel, but for the fastest, safest, least costly, most environmentally uh, benign form of technology that we have. It's teleportation via the portal or teleporters that a Tesla route. How are we seeing it? Well, back when we were doing it as small children, uh, they were training a cadre of American school children to become an uh, adult cadre of U.S. products. So they were purposely using us from childhood to get us accustomed to the form of time travel. Back then, it was a new dangerous environmental technology because they had just achieved the portal teleportation of that particular device from Tesla shop network around 1967 68. 
get based on the conversation that's going to be my father and Dr. Nagy during that, that first teleporting that I took with my father. So when I was placed in the program in the fall of 1969, uh, I knew that there were several mishaps and I was a witness. One, of, one thing that happened is one of the young girls in the program looked up at the crystal array hanging from the ceiling of one of the chronolizers, which was so dense as a light source that it actually had a lensing effect whereby a non local event was holographic or portrayed or broadcast in the laboratory. Well, as a result of the brightness of that light, she lost her vision permanently. She was blind. I was witness to a mishap, but one of my same engineers, uh, we were jumping uh, into an abandoned school site in Santa Fe to prepare us for having the experience of performing espionage in foreign countries as groups of children jumped in simultaneously from different teleports around the United States. And one of the boys arrived in that, uh, that abandoned school site, abandoned middle school. And uh, unfortunately, one of the public fountains had not been completely drained for the build up of rainwater or leaking. And so he arrived standing in that public fountain, standing in about three inches of water. And because of the specific gravity of the water, the, the part of his body where the surface of the water was, so that at the middle of his ankle, arrived a split second after the rest of his body. And so he slid off his ankle tumbled out of the fountain, having been detached from his feet. And my dislocation, I had, I had popped into view from via the teleporter that I jumped through, and didn't clearly access that location for some other teleport around the eastern United States. He was writhing on the ground, screaming, my feet, my feet, I'm only nine years old, what am I going to do without any feet? So when I considered the fact that some of my, my contemporaries in childhood had lost their, their sight or lost their feet, as children, giving humanity new ways of going places and seeing things in the universe, I felt morally compelled to bring this information forward because of the parts that they had. While you've been talking, Andrew, I've noticed on the corner of my eye that my colleague Gary uh, got a big fascination on his face when we were speaking about the tunnel. Um, did you want to share something about that, Gary? Yeah, I, I guess I can, man, because uh, back in 1974, I had one of those so-called lived experiences, which I uh, know is uh, an unknown thing as far as I can see. I've never heard of it, it's a bit a lot. And of course, it's the, it's the tunnel. It's going down that, that tunnel. You're aware of light and sound around you, but it's, it stretches out forever. And there was a never-ending bend of the tunnel around the bend, and of course, where I went with my reaction, uh, and the uh, reaction of these things, um, of course, everything stopped, and I was now staring into a dock in five minutes, and of course, my first thought was at that time, and I heard the doctor's voice coming through saying, I think you're safe, I think you've got it, my reaction was, no, 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 do you know I am, I don't want to come back. So there was no sort of, um, you know, five stairs going up there, and all the sorts of uh, people from my past or the creator waiting to welcome me to send me back. But interesting, and uh, I, I could just see parallels in what you explained to us and what you experienced. So it was wonderful that uh, the times of trauma, uh, we can go places. Yes, and bodily, because for example, Kathleen showed up physically in front of her mother's house in the time that she wasn't able to go back and run in the same time period after fully recovering to become a marathon. Uh, and also, when we were jumping through the portal tunnel, that's what the device propagates. What happens is you essentially, as you leap through the ring of energy, your inertia opens up a bubble in time space, sort of interstitial chasm. That is very like the tunnel that is recorded in the near death experience. The paradox is that it's illuminated, and there doesn't seem to be any external light storm. And there's a low humming sound. I have no idea where that was coming from. And we were doing it physically. We were going through the universe physically. And what I've learned since then, in fact, is that space is exceptionally dense. In fact, one meter of space has as many curves of energy stored in it as all of the grains of sand on every beach on Earth. So we're talking about an exceptionally densely energetic universe 
that nonetheless Tesla discovered a form of energy that is pervasive in that physical universe that we can sort of shift it in and then jump through. I'm not a physicist, but that's what I learned we were doing. He had found this form of energy, the device was basically a tuning device that broadcast that form of energy between the two elliptical shaped armatures of the teleport. And when that curtain of shimmering radiant energy was manifested collaboratively, we were jumping through it physically and popping out thousands of miles away in several seconds. So that could revolutionize transportation for our planet. So there's no reason why we shouldn't attempt it to introduce civilian teleportation in the 1970s, which was my father's position. In fact, he was constantly advocating it. I was in this, in his presence, in New Mexico, we were on the project. And Andrew, there is a, uh, a television show called Fringe. Have you heard of it? I not only heard of it, but after I introduced my life story to ABC Disney in January 2008, number of my story elements have appeared in French. In the, they recall the episode where Walter Bishop held his young, the, the, the hand of his young son, Peter. Well, that was uh, inspired by Raymond Bishago holding the hand of his young son, not Peter, but Peter's brother in the New Testament, Andrew, and jumping through the device of Curtis Wright, which I just described at the top of the show. So, so I think my producer saw that episode and she nudged me to make sure I'd ask you that question. Uh, French, has, French has been partly inspired by one of my experiences. For example, the word quantivisor appeared, it's appeared before West, or the, let's say in America, having been developed by the two Vatican priests or any which remember in Italy, two Vatican politicists at the Catholic University of Milan in the 40s and 50s. But essentially the fact that I describe my quantivisor experience in that presentation is given. I think also led the Chronovision to introduce a story on print. This, is, this seems to be happening quite a lot with actual real information that's being planted at least seed in, in Hollywood films and, and TV shows. Yeah, I have a lot more faith in, in film. I think that television almost culturally, almost addictively, can't tell the truth if it's a controversial truth. So they insist on telling not ordinary fact as fiction. Whereas I think Hollywood has told a lot of unusual stories that follow reality. Maybe we're even creating the reality based on the <laughs> But there's a feedback and also, you know, science fiction was introduced as a genre during and after World War II to confuse other countries and public about the secret advent of particular technologies. For example, around the time that the Tesla teleporter was understood to be a teleporter introduced in the U.S. defense technical community secretly around 1966-67, Star Trek debuted on American TV showing an entirely opposite form of teleportation. So what they tend to do is they tend to, they tend to tell the, the basic story with sort of denatured facts. So they, they make the public aware that the book teleportation might be or is, but then they, they describe it in a way that wouldn't allow anybody else to, to achieve it. So they introduced it basically a fictional form of teleportation. The, the form of teleportation on Star Trek is quantum teleportation, which has led to so many contemporary science news articles about individuals who are working in quantum teleportation. And in that form of teleportation, we disintegrate the teleport being at the point of embarkation and then reintegrate their cellular material at the point of destination. And the problem with that is that would, that would kill any living organism. So we're going to need, and we have already achieved, portal teleportation where the opposite happens. Yeah. Where the portal tunnel is opened up and the teleportation passes through it. I would say, I've always been interested with these types of things that what don't come with us and what doesn't. I mean, what, to what extent uh, are we able to, to bring something with us? Well, something that's unattached can fall off in the portal tunnel, like let's say not half. But most of the articles of modern clothing are sort of ultimately to be the portal. They're sort of stuck to our body as a result of sticking our arms and then laying through them. Uh, and and our, our shoes, of course, or sneakers are usually uh, tied on with our shoelaces and so forth. So anything that's going to stay on your body in a wind, you know, wind storm is going to stay on your body in 
these horizontal tunnels and the other forms of this type. But I did have items of clothing wrenched off my body during some of my time travel experiences in my past. And even my shoes, when I was sent to Gettysburg in 1863 by a plasma confinement, my shoes were literally wrenched off in a violent wormhole that I passed in the Gettysburg destination. So it's very much like a wind tunnel. If it can stand, stay on your body in that environment, it will stay with you for a while. So the viewers that might be interested in this well, there's a whole interview that his body is around the radio station from the coast to coast. Right, my first uh, mainstream uh, radio appearance was on Coast to Coast to Animal with George Murray uh, in November of uh, 2009. Uh, in November 2010, the two major exposés of the secret U.S. time travel report. And in fact, I ended up, I ended up, get, ended up convincing a supermajority of listeners, 65% of listeners, to believe me. Uh, 20% did not, and the other 15% had no opinion. So I actually got more support during that 2009 interview than men who were elected governors in New York and California got in the right to go out. That might come in handy when you run for presidency. I, I, I think that I, I, I've silenced my critics now, I think, for factual certainty because I had spent 10 years before that first post to post AM interview going back and actively investigating, doing hours and hours, probably. Over a thousand hours of field investigation and of memory work to go back to all of my experience of location, describing time travel technology, describing their provenance, their their function, the effects that they cause, the places I visited. So I essentially had I'm in possession of an insider's account of the emergence of time travel secretly in the U.S. That's technically under dark. So for those who have approached my, my whistleblower testimony with an open mind, they know that I'm telling the truth just based on the amount of information I brought, the consistency of it. I have been caught in an inconsistency or a lie because I'm telling the truth. I resolved to not to not embellish. In fact, I've held back a lot that I think may be going on as well, but I can't I can't actually describe. So so I think I I think I've prevailed. I think that those who are aware of my story know that I'm telling the truth. And in fact, I am. But I'm the first to come forward and tell the true history. So it had a, a major effect on the first to post analysts. So I started looking at the President of the United States. And I was looking at the President of the United States. I was looking at the President of the United States. You haven't been blacklisted. 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 You
her out. And I was sitting there almost like an inquest, and there were about 20 villagers sitting in three tiers. And the elder of their neighborhood, a man, was questioning me in Dutch. He was saying, like, English, Latin? You know, he thought, he thought apparently I was a British boy, because I think they could detect that I was speaking English. Yeah. So they had fallen into the English Channel and had been carried over to the Netherlands. But I was actually questioned in Holland, probably almost, I don't know, almost 200 years before you were born. Oh my god, this is great. So, so, so Andrew, um, when you're being qualified, does this mean that you have no influence uh, in the setting that is being played out around you? I'll come to there. When you're, when you're qualified to the location, we were being sent there as a kind of Superliminal superimposition over that event scenario in time space. So we could be, we could see and be seen by other sentient beings. And in fact, they sent me back to brief General Washington to advise him to retreat from New York Harbor, uh, in, in what then became the Battle of Britain Heights. So that was in August of 1776. That was critical in terms of the Revolutionary Army not being decimated. They had some reason to try to reinforce that decision by sending me back and having me actually meet Washington as an advisor. George Washington was an impeccable individual. I, was, I still have a vision of him in my mind. He was, um, he was so brilliant, he was almost illuminated with the white light. He was that striking in person. Uh, so in those cases, when I was going back in time by a chronovision, I was indistinguishable from someone from that time. Washington even asked us whether we were angels. And I showed him a, uh, I, I showed him a two-dimensional hologram with the laminate, you know, sheet of paper with a two-dimensional hologram with laminate over it, to show him that we work from the future. So General Washington certainly didn't do my business work. I hope this convinces you that we're time traveling in the future. But he initially asked us whether we were angels, but we think that our meeting with Washington may have actually led to that legend that George Washington had been invited as an angel. We, we could see and be seen. We weren't either invisible entities nor uh, otherwise. We were, we were there in a, in a light pattern that human beings and animals from that time period would see as an ordinary human being. Okay, that's in talk. Um, my colleague Gary uh, and I, we um, went out into the bush uh, about seven months ago to uh, make a documentary about the very first New Zealand. And when we came home in the evening and we spotted our footage, uh, we noticed that while we were in the bush, there were two or three illuminated white beings behind us. And as we zoomed in, um, they were looking at us from behind the tree. And as soon as they realized they were being filmed, they went, they went back. Um, all you could see was the humanoid shape, white, glowy. And um, after watching your interview, or listening to your interview on Coast to Coast, I had this funny theory that I thought, well, perhaps these were people from the future. We're dealing with many different types of beings, and they've all been documented. There are angels, who are essentially messengers from the heavenly realm, basically the eternal realm that this temporal realm emanates from. Uh, there are time travelers from other dimensions in our own future. We have extraterrestrial visitors that are both biological entities and non-biological entities that are using time travel devices to get here at this time space coordinate. So it's really all of the above. And the reckoning of somebody like General Washington, who had, was clearly from the privileged class in the colonies and, and was literate and had, had as much access to books as anybody in that time and place could have had. From his place of understanding, as a Christian growing up in the world, he, he, he imagined that we had to be angels because of the depiction of the angels in the Bible, where, for example, there are several angels appear to, to advise Lot to be Sodom, and they were described as basically human beings, white clothing, very bright looking. And then we have the two angels that appear in Jesus' crib. Uh, so, so Bible educated. Westerners like Washington would have conceived of these unexplained visitors as angels. And that's what he was questioning. He even asked it several times. He said, well, tell me, you are angels, aren't you? And I said, no, sir, we are visitors from your own future. In fact, I 
was I was given a script that I had to memorize, and it was basically I mean, 40 years. But I, I basically uh, I had to memorize a script that basically said, uh, "General Washington, we are time traveling from your own future, the, the 1970s, not the 1770s, so 20 years from your own future, excuse me, 200 years from your own future." Uh, I told him that you are destined to win the war that you are currently waging. It will lead to the forming of a new country called the United States of America. After a period of governance under some provisional presidents, you will be recognized as the first president of the United States and as the father of your country. And that country's capital will be named after you. It will be called Washington, District of Columbia. Uh, but none of those uh, propitious things will happen if you do not retreat your troops immediately from New York Harbor. Your army will be decimated and you will lose the war. So this is one of the mysteries of some of the missions that we were sent on. We were sent to basically reinforce several critical moments in history. And this was one of them. In the case of going to Gettysburg Address, that was sort of a treat, was sort of a privilege that I was given because I had performed ably and well during the first three years of my involvement in the program. And my father and Dr. Sorrell told me to state that they would now give me the opportunity to see the Gettysburg Address as it was happening. And then I'm aware that um, we need to start, unfortunately, <laughs> slowly ending the interview. I, I, I could talk for not only hours more, probably days more, if it was up to me. Uh, probably also a lot of questions are still coming up for me, and I'm, I'm sure you can ask me and the viewers want to as well. So um, I, I would just like to ask one more question, and that is how were crystals and sacred geometry used with the teleportation process? I think the issue of sacred geometry is perfect. Nicola Tesla once stated that if you could understand the secret of 3, 6, and 9, you would know one of the keys to the universe. So I have to believe that somehow a crystalline construct of 3, 6, and 9 may explain how the radiant energy that is in the universe was, was, was being captured by the test of the device and used as a means, means to open up a tunnel as an interstitial chasm in the fabric of time space. And the reason that that statement by Tesla is so important to understand what we were doing is that three of the project principles told me personally that Project Pegasus owed its greatest debt of gratitude technically to Nicola Tesla, that was my father Raymond, that was Jack Pruitt, who was one of the team leaders, and also Dr. Robert Beckman, the very prominent American electrical engineer and inventor, were constantly referencing the, the debt of gratitude for the project that was tested. So Project Pegasus would not have achieved operational time travel had Nicola Tesla not pioneered and left the documents regarding in his papers in the title of 43. Now, uh, the other issue is the role specifically the crystal. What we know, again, when I question my father about this issue, is that the, the, the electro-optical device is called chronobar, that the Catholic uh, priest, musicologist, Renetti and Trevelli, had accidentally discovered as a means of retrieving a, a signal from a past or future event and amplifying it the lensing of the laboratory so-called chronomarks, were propagating the hologram that they were via uh, driving an electromagnetic signal through an eight-sided array of polished bismuth crystals. Bismuth is element 83. So the, the emergent technology involving crystallography in the 20th century, the development of radio by Tesla and Marconi, and the work that was done before and after World War II on crystallography led to the development of chronomarks. Now, of course, crystals are faceted. Maybe that relates somehow to the 369 pattern of the Tesla reference. But yes, I would have to say that sacred geometry was germane to the development, probably, of teleportation. That was the principal contribution that Tesla contributed to the U.S. time-space program emerge was these devices were fully operational by 1970. And we know that the crystals were at the heart of the applied holography that was allowing the program to 
retrieve a residual signal from the past event for an emergent or, or potential, potential signal from a future event and amplify the brain to the laboratory. Is China building a time machine in the future? I'll tell you later. No, I'm just giving them from the future. I'll tell you right now. According to popular mechanics, China swears it isn't building a time machine. Mm -hmm. But maybe they are. From popular mechanics, earlier this month, unsubstantiated documents began circulating online that seem to suggest the Chinese Academy of Sciences Institute of High Energy Physics is partnering with a private retail technology development technology on something called the Space Time Tunnel Generation Experimental Device. China's the paper journalist, which obtained a leaked PowerPoint presentation containing information about the project, has this to say about the device. This is by way of six part news. The device can distort time and space, control the flow rate of time, break through the barrier of time and space, and be widely used for time travel, interstellar voyage, life extension, etc. The project plans to select a location in China, at least an area of about 16 acres, to build a scientific experiment base. It is expected that the device will be able to successfully shuttle the space time experiment seven to twelve months after the funds are in place. The PowerPoint also claims first six parts that the team behind the project has reached a preliminary cooperation agreement with a research and development team composed of well-known experts and accredited missions of the Institute of High Energy Physics of the Chinese Academy of Science and that Nobel laureate Gao Ku recognized and praised the device in addition to other esteemed scientists. Now the Academy is fired back saying it's not true that our institute and the Shanxi Retai Technology mentioned in the article has anything to do with this, no contact, no cooperation, and we're not going to be responsible for this propaganda. But what's stranger about this is that Wutai Technology has only been a company since December 31st, 2020, and our boy Gao Kuhn, as well as three of these active omissions, don't even exist. Founder of the project, Huawei Wei, said that there was a clerical error in the production of the PPT financing information service platform, which is a mistake. So it sounds to me like they're not building a time machine, but they're setting up relationships, funding, and real estate to build a time machine. All I know is this is wrong on so many levels. Oh, God.
way some type of uh, uh, counter uh, counter offensive measure to alleviate that threat. Some of the people for us personally and for some of our other ones are coming back. By doing you in a real war, like it's a real war, but it's not as visual as it should be. So, like for most people, they don't understand it. Obviously, they don't understand that piece, but at least they know and have some type of chance to get out of bed. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what that's called, or 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 what that's called, Yeah. 
for all doctors under the age of 50, uh, doctors are dying at twice the rate in 2021 and 2022 compared to 2019 and 2020. So that since the rollout of the COVID vaccines, they're dying at double the rate. But this is where it gets very interesting and, and, and sadly shocking is when you look at doctors under the age of 40, they're dying at five times the rate this year compared to the pre-vaccine rollout. And doctors under the age of 30 are dying at eight times the rate compared to the pre-vaccine rollout era. And this is really where, you know, we see the deaths in medical residents um, and young doctors, doctors who have just graduated, because we know that, you know, all the medical schools in Canada have implemented and forced on their medical students and medical residents COVID vaccine mandates. They all have to be fully up to date on their vaccinations so that they could work in the hospital or rotate through the hospital. So what you see in the data, which is very robust, is that as you get younger in age, the death, the, the rate, uh, the mortality rate, skyrockets uh, since the rollout of the vaccines. And so this is really, to me, the, a signal, a safety signal um, that really implicates the vaccines because that's the only common factor, um, especially in, in all these sudden deaths where there were no pre-existing medical conditions. I believe that a lot of these deaths uh, may be caused by subclinical myocarditis. Uh, and when I mentioned subclinical myocarditis, uh, it's, it's still inflammation of the heart, but the subclinical part means that the person doesn't have any symptoms. So they don't know that they have inflammation of the heart. They may have scarring that has damaged their heart muscle as a result of the inflammation. And that predisposes them to a sudden fatal arrhythmia. Um, and then, you know, they end up dying suddenly either in their sleep or while they're exercising. For example, one of the McMaster medical residents who died, 27-year-old Dr. Candice Naiman, she was a triathlete and she had actually collapsed while doing a triathlon while swimming. Uh, she collapsed in the swimming portion and they managed to get her to the ICU and she died four days later. Uh, so I believe that um, subclinical myocarditis caused by the spike protein, which is very highly inflammatory, uh, could be the cause for many of these sudden deaths. Because I did, I did talk of the wrong, I realized it's not the wrong, I was that false note, right, of anybody. And I was also, I was not art, and I had no psychiatry history of course. All these allegations of these uh, legal were wrong. And uh, so they couldn't arrest me, so obviously they tried something else and they, 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 they didn't know how to perhaps deal with me, so they, they put me into go to psychiatry. But then they, they gave me the, the uh, opportunity to decide, either you stay here in the psychiatric hospital for six weeks to have treated this mania, or you can leave and go home and continue to work, but you must take the medication and say, I was forced to take a neuroleptic. And whether I took it or not was weekly controlled by the blood check. So this is a really Soviet style, TDR style, uh, psychiatric methods. This is outrageous. So this is Switzerland. For everybody listening right now, I want you to all know that this is happening in Switzerland. And you were forced to take a psychiatric medication because you spoke out against COVID-19 restrictions and measures. Am I right? Yes. But of course, this, as I said, the Corona insane other side decided I must do Corona insane. So uh, from their point of view, this was of course uh, correct. But from my point of view, this was completely wrong. Yeah, this is this was Switzerland only in April 20.
Bye. Okay. Have you ever been in the uh, 